as you thought. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we as real as you thought. Real fans, real talk, reporting live from the cam. High in demand, so please stand by if you can. What we got is worth a lot, so put a tie on your plans. On court, talking sports through the eyes of the fans. With Trip Young, Emma Marie, Eric Sanchez. You heard what I said, we elite. Check the latest topics and stay ahead of the beat. Keep us in your topics and uh -huh. we ahead of the Yo. streets. It's Johnny Floss, bringing a different type of blend. Backing up Misfit to make sure y'all tuned in. You gotta watch, this show is one of a kind. Updates on your TV screen from 8 to 9. For the older folks, so even if you're younger, no matter what sport, this show, we got it covered. It's filmed live in the middle of BK, so ain't no better sports show to watch on Thursdays. Real fans, real talk, we as real as you thought. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we as real as you thought. What's going on, guys? We are back. Another Quarantine TV edition of Real Fans, Real Talk. And uh, it's definitely a special episode right now. I'm starting off the show solo, but uh, Eric is going to join me in a little while. But I do have a very special guest. And usually when I tell y'all I got family coming through to the show, they be family, but they don't be like blood, you know, related family. You know what I'm saying? So this time I actually got to bring some of my real family through. I'm so proud of her and I'm so happy for her. She is a, a great uh, coach and she's been coaching for a long time. She's also uh, played basketball for a, for a very long time. As, far, as long as I can remember, she's been playing basketball, um, played college ball. Uh, we, I think she was like third, if I can remember, in in, in steals um, back in her college days. I'm gonna have to when she when she get on, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna have her tell you a little bit more about her stats. But uh, Shanae, welcome to the show. I'm so happy you could be here. Hey, what's going on, Anthony? I am happy to be here. It's so crazy how, you know, I think a lot of people kind of use that term loosely, like, oh, that's my family. Oh, that's my cousin. But people don't know, like, we like cousin cousins, like first yeah. cousins, real cousins. <laughs> exactly. You know, I was um I was speaking to uh Aaron uh the other day from the Baldur's Journal. Shout out to uh to to, to those guys. And yes. uh, she had posted a picture of you and I was like, you know, that's my cousin, right? She was like, What? She knows your cousin? Uh, yeah, so it was like, yeah, we had like a whole little, little woman. Like, yeah, that's my actual, actual cousin. And um, you are officially uh, the Junior NBA Coach of the Year. So just uh, talk to me about about that. We're just going to go straight to the award first. And then we're going to get to it was, if it was third in the, in the, in the in, in steals or what it was when, in your college days. What was you ranked at? I know okay, it was, first said. of all, it was first. It was first in my conference okay. in steals. And I was also nationally ranked in steals in the country. But um, I did go to NYU, Division three school, um, had a number of opportunities to go to uh, low-level Division one programs on full rides, but really chose NYU because if anyone that knows, especially um, – New York City basketball, the way that our program is run, it's run like a D1 program, right? We do everything that D1 programs do with respect to travel, hotels, food, um, even hospitality, right? Uh, the only thing that we don't have is a charter plane. Like we don't have an NYU plane. But other gotcha. than that, with respect to our budget and allocations of money, we we were living it up better than even some of my um, my Division I counterparts, right? Some of my teammates that went to Division I programs, they weren't doing nearly as much as uh, what we were doing down at NYU. So shout out to Janice Quinn, shout out to the uh, NYU Women's Basketball Violets. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, so the Junior NBA Coach of the Year Award, I mean, it's interesting, right? I, two years ago, created, um, and I really have to back, back up because it was four years ago when I first started to put together this proposal to have a nonprofit, right? And the idea behind the nonprofit was there was a need in New York City for girls basketball programs that developed at younger ages, right? The biggest piece that I kept on noticing was kids were jumping into the pipeline a little too late. And so as they went through middle school, as they went to high school, they just weren't really that good. Um, so there had to be a, a bigger attention to what, what's the piece that's missing here. And so after a lot of research, I realized there was nothing being offered for younger girls, right? There was a lot of programs being offered for younger boys. Maybe within that program, you'd have one or two girls in it whose, again, fathers were big advocates for them to play basketball. 
but you just didn't really see it. And so what I decided to do was to create um, my nonprofit on basically the premise that it's important to have early sports exposures for girls. We can actually debunk all of these myths and all the statistics that are out right now about girls not wanting to participate or it's not really that they don't wanna participate, it's just that opportunities for them to participate don't exist, right? So it's about really creating solutions for that. And again, I've been coaching and I've been playing basketball longer than I've been coaching, but um, I've been coaching for 17 years. And so I think that a lot of the work that I've been putting in over the years has really brought me to this point. Um, and again, shout out to Riverside Church. I was actually there for my um, first seven years. And again, shout out to, to the Gauchos, New York City Gauchos, where I've been at now for eight years. And, um, you know, also dealt with some, some coaching in between and coached at NYU, right, for four years. I was actually a first assistant college coach. But I say all that to say that there was so much that was available for girls, but not at younger ages. And so again, being able to create a solution for that was really how Grow Our Game started. And it's interesting even how the award came up because my parents decided to nominate me for the Junior Knicks Coach of the Year Award. I ended up winning, like, okay. <laughs> so then I ended up being selected as a semifinalist for the Junior NBA Coach of the Year Award, which then put me into a position um, after them reviewing, uh, put me in a position of being one of three finalists. And so now it's like, okay, I'm one of the three finalists. Like, okay, that's kind of cool. Um, but, you know, again, just to get the news, I, I think it's it's incredible. And it's it's also just bringing a lot more transparency and urgency to corporate folk, right, that need to understand that there is an important um, investment that's needed to support girls basketball, right? And if you start supporting younger, you actually end up seeing an incredibly huge return on your investment as they get older, right? Because we already know the statistics for women that are in C-suite positions. 90% of them actually participated in sports. Um, when they were in either college, high school, or even a lower level, there's direct correlations to success for our girls when they play sports. And so I just do it through the lens of basketball. <laughs> now, definitely. Uh, congratulations. Um, who, who was it actually that broke the news to you? Cause I know I saw you had posted the, uh, you know, Allen Houston uh, call you guys, you guys did, which was, which was dope. Uh, but who actually, was it him that broke it to you or was it somebody else in the organization? So Alan Houston uh, definitely told me that I was a finalist. And it's so it, it's so interesting because he's, you know, in the video, he's like, oh, call me Alan. And I'm just like, this is incredible. This is like one of my idols. Um, and one of my even bigger idols, uh, John Starks actually broke the news of me becoming Junior Knicks Coach wow. of the Year. That's dope. Shout out to uh, John Starks. He's, he's been on the program before. He showed us a lot of love. So big shout out to him. Yo, incredible. And so again, to then have a, a Zoom call, which I'm assuming it's just a Zoom call, um, but it ends up actually being Alan Houston on the call. I'm in like a mob deep t-shirt with a headscarf on. <laughs> <laughs> We're quarantining, right? So I wasn't prepared for that conversation and it was incredible. And so again, just to take it a step further, um, it, it's, it was beyond my wildest dreams. I really don't look at awards or um, recognition. I think that the recognition I get is from my families and from my girls and when they come back, right? And so when they come back and they tell me just how amazing and fun their experience was playing for me and how I was a little crazy, <laughs> but how I loved really hard, right? And how I wouldn't give up on them um, and how I had to sometimes lean in a little bit more to get parents to lean in some more. Um, I think that all of those things were incredible. And so I'm just, I, I'm truly blessed. You know, I'm, I'm truly blessed. And there, there's so much more to come. So much more to come. We just literally had Brianna Stewart on a Zoom call with our girls um, right. on Tuesday. And it was like one of the most incredible experiences for our girls to be in front of, right? Not necessarily physically facing, but again, this is our new normal right now. Yeah. But to, to, to be facing her in a Zoom call and literally asking her questions and talking about her journey through basketball and where she stands on, you know, racial equality and why it's important to support not only girls, 
that play, but also to support the black and brown community, right? The black and brown communities that have been marginalized and not mm -hmm. supported systemically for almost 400 years, right? That was pretty powerful. Um, so, you know, I'm just, I just, I, I continue to think and try to figure out how I can continue um, to support my girls um, and how I can, it's not even about topping or replicating, but it's about how can I provide to them the best possible service um, knowing that again, I don't even get paid to do this, right? It's actually like fun work. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that, listen, that, that's amazing. Um, first of all, congratulations again on, on both of those things. You know, that, that is so, when I, when, I, when I found out, man, I'm like, I was like really proud of you, you know what I'm saying? And I, I, I know that your, your girls right now after uh, being on that uh, Zoom call, oh my goodness, I know, you know, I know they look up to her. But I know now, like, the admiration and the love that they must have for you now for making that happen, you know, like, I know that's a, that's a, a huge thing. Because I know as a kid, if I got to, to, to meet MJ or somebody, you know what I'm saying, he came to my little, my little team practice, something like that, whether, you know, Zoom or not, because, again, that's the, that's the new norm. But I, I know those, those girls are really like, wow, Coach did that for us. We got we to gotta go out there and give our all, all the Coach. We wouldn't chip this year. Yeah, no, it, it was a really big deal. And again, shout out to all my parents because my parents make this happen, right? Girls between the ages of four to seven, even four to nine, which is the group that we target right now. Um, and again, that, that, that target age is going to continue to grow out, right? Because I'm building a pipeline. Um, and so, you know, I just thank my parents for the amount of support relentless support that they've given to me. Um, I've learned a lot more about parental involvement and engagement um, during these last two years. Um, and so again, I'm, I'm nothing without my parents. I'm nothing without my girls. Um, I'm a pretty damn good coach though. I'm a pretty amazing teacher. Uh, I do have to pat myself on the back for that. My energy is unmatched, right? Like Truck Bryant's words, my energy is unmatched. But um, I can say that also my heart is is unmatched also right and I, I really give big especially when it comes to girls basketball no that's 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 a fact um so, you know do are the parents involved um a lot with the girls like are they coming out to the games are they are they really involved yeah i mean so again they're the, the they're the mode of transportation right like they're the ones that are responsible for making sure their daughters make it on time from point a to point b and usually little ballers which is our youngest cohort from four to seven we go saturday mornings right so imagine parents on a friday night you're yeah. expecting not to work on saturday but you have to wake up early in the morning to make sure your daughter makes it on time for little ballers that's dedication and so you know again uh, I have a also interesting recruitment for coaches that actually help and support me during our clinics um, and during our program. So our parents, all they have to do is just bring their daughters, kick back, relax, and just support. Um, and again, shout out to my parent paparazzi because I, I, you know, once in a while I have a photographer. I've actually hired Troy uh, a few times, Troy Williams, a few times, um, Mocha Poca on Instagram. She's a super dope um, black female photographer, which again, it's, it's really about reinforcing all of those things that are not necessarily norms. So it's for the girls to see like a, a woman of color taking pictures. It's like, that's pretty powerful too. So I'm really big on messaging. Right. And so, um, even for our parents, they're all different shades of, of, the, of the, the rainbow and of the spectrum. And I'm really happy, right? Like we have moms and dads, we have moms, we have dads, we have mommies, we have daddies, right? I think that that is so important. Um, and also just understanding that there's still space for your daughters to learn the game of basketball. Yeah, no, that's, and, and, and that's, that's what it's all about. Um, Cause you know, we definitely, you need that parent, that parental support, man, for these, for these, you know, these young black and brown kids, they need to see that, that love and that support as well. So I'm, I'm glad to hear that the parents are, are getting involved. Um, and I want I want to go a little bit into into your playing career a little bit more because you also you did a little a little street ball um, in your time as well and every, like it seemed like every time I, I would float around I, then people that that we know you know what I'm saying that are, are friends of the show they'll they'll be they'll mention you or something like that um, you know one of one of our, our good friends uh, over at Hoops and Sun 
uh, Joe Joe Cruz and those guys. I know they 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 had spoke about you at one point. So now you played over at Hoops in the Sun. I did. I actually did. It, it's so funny because I remember playing in the All Star game. Uh, I think it was like definitely two years. It was still during the time that I was at NYU. I actually played for a shout out to a team franchise. Shout out to Jamel um, Hanson and also Eagle who again coached us and were amazing with making sure that we had opportunities to play city basketball because those tournaments are expensive. Um, And so they always took good care of us. And yeah, I did play in Hoops in the Sun and it was a pretty dope experience. I mean, you think that you, you, you think you play in New York City summer heat, go up to Orchard (laughs) Beach. Ain't nothing like it. You're going to get a nice little suntan and, you know, play some, play some ball. And again, it, it's also about that mental toughness, right? That I think yeah. it, it needs to just continue to come back um, because playing outside in the summertime in New York city. Um, I think that for me, I, I was actually just telling a colleague, that's one of the reasons why I still live and work in New York city. I could have easily fled New York yeah. and went to any other state, any other metropolitan city in the country to work. And I stayed largely because of my love for New York City summer basketball um, and summer in the city. So, yeah. you know, yeah, shout out, shout out to, uh, shout out to Joe and Randy up at uh, Hoops in the Sun in, in Orchard Beach, man. They, That's a fact. Good, good I'm, stuff I'm, happening. I'm upset, man, because, you know, it's not going to be no Hoops in the Sun this summer. Um, you know, Joe, they, they announced Joe and Randy announced. We were, we were there. Almost every weekend last summer, myself and Eric uh, was up at the beach um, supporting and just seeing what was going on, watching the games, enjoying the sight, the vibe of the beach. Like you said, it's just a whole different uh, type of thing. It's an amazing, um, you know what I'm saying, place to play basketball. And it's nothing like that in the summer. Um, I'm going to jump around a little bit because I'm, um, I'm looking at the picture behind you on the wall. Um, I see you got the, you got the Kobe in the, in the, in the MJ up. Uh, ah yes 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 yes. Yeah, rest in peace to uh to Kobe. I know you're a big uh Kobe uh fan. So just talk to me about about what Kobe meant to to you. Sure. I mean, Kobe to me was the goat, right? Like I um when I was a kid, I um you know we we didn't have a lot of money, right? So we made the best of what we had. I never had a chance to really experience ever MJ in the garden, right? Like um, some of my counterparts or some of my, my friends uh, that I went to college with. And so for me, uh, my MJ was for damn sure Kobe Bryant. And again, it was, it was just incredible to see him play and to see him dissect the defender. Um, And yeah, so I, I, I grew up on just loving Kobe Bryant. And I I say grow up because I actually grew up loving the Knicks. But as I got older and started to make a little bit of money, right, I realized that I could actually go and attend sporting events. And so I made it my business to make sure that every time Kobe Bryant was in that garden, I got tickets. And it was so incredible to be able to see him just put on a performance unlike any other, right? Um, and even when his jerseys got retired, both jerseys got retired, I actually bought a super expensive ticket, um, was literally right behind the hoop uh, at the Staples Center and stayed in an Airbnb in downtown LA, which was shady. Downtown LA is not the place you want to really stay in if you're not familiar <laughs> with Los Angeles, but, um, but had an incredible experience of being able to, to be there to see Kobe and see those jerseys retired. Um, and it was literally right above my shoulder. So as like, you know, the lights went on to show this, the jerseys, it was like literally right above me, which was so incredible. Um, yeah. So yeah, I'm just, I'm really blessed that I was able to have that experience. And again, um, losing him was, was really tough. He was such a big advocate um, for girls basketball, for women's basketball, and brought a lot of um, support to light, right? Mm-hmm. And um, again, his daughter had that desire and that fire to want to learn the game. And, um, you know, he's, he, he'll definitely be missed. I think that he's taught us so many different life lessons. And so that's really how, um, how I want to continue to to operate and move, right? And, and learn. Um, and so, yeah, it was, it was a dope piece um, that I saw on Instagram and I was like, Oh my God, I have to buy this. And so I, I, I got it. <laughs> no, that's, that's definitely what's up. Rest in peace to Kobe and, and Gigi. 
And uh, like you mentioned, Kobe was, you know, doing a lot of stuff with the WNBA. Uh, one of the, the things that we got into, we, well, we talked about it several times on the show, um, you know, is the, you know, I guess the, the pay scales within the NBA and the, and the WNBA, but just uh, more so how uh, can we improve on on the WNBA and, and, and what they're getting. I know they had a, they actually had a big uh, change a couple of months ago. So things have gotten a little bit better as far as the pay scale goes. But how can we help viewership? I think that's more so what it is because, I mean, even if, if you raise the, the pay or whatever and the viewers are not there, then, it's, you know, eventually it'll start to fizzle out. So what do you think can be done to really boost up the WNBA? So I think that the first piece is like obviously knowing your market and honing into your market. Um, when you know your market, you actually end up having repeat customers. You end up having loyal customers. You end up having folks that will truly buy in to, um, to the program and to the team. Um, and so, you know, I think that there's that piece. But I also think that, again, you still have to kind of stand up, right, and speak for what is right and, and kind of say what's wrong and point out what is wrong. Um, and so again, I, I can't even talk about the, the WNBA, CBA, um, their collective bargaining agreement without really putting into perspective USA Women's Soccer Team, right? USA Women's Soccer Team ended up paving the way for that space to be allowed to even talk and discuss an option to have a collective bargaining agreement revised, right? And so again, that's amazing. And you also have Cheney Abumake, who is um, part of the uh, players union for the WNBA. And she was pretty much the spokesperson and the face behind it. And so when you have someone that comes from Stanford, that had a decorated career at Stanford, um, and also did extremely well on, on the professional level within the WNBA, you're also putting a little bit more power to the message. So um, I think, you know, again, shout out to the, the USA women's um, soccer team, that, that national team really held it down and, and paved the way um, for other organizations like the WNBA to actually start questioning and asking why um, we shouldn't be getting paid, why we're not getting paid more and why we should be getting paid more, right? Um, so I think that that's big. And obviously, you know, again, uh, tapping into new, client you know bases and creating new fan bases um is definitely something big i also think again when you think about all of this like remote everything's been remote and like virtual what does that look like then for the WNBA experience i definitely think that that's a new market that people maybe weren't thinking about back then but there definitely is some sort of value to now um and again i'm not any sort of sports sports marketing expert at all but I at least know girls basketball, right? Like I know girls basketball, I know women's basketball, knowing it enough because I'm a fan. Um, and so that, that would just be my perspective on it. Obviously you still have your advertising, you still have your corporate sponsorship, but I think there's gonna be a little bit more space for creativity, um, especially during these times, folks had a chance to really um, kind of trial and error and test and yeah. see new ways. So we'll see, we'll see how it goes. I'm ready to buy season tickets for the New York Liberty though. I mean, I'm ready they, to purchase season tickets. They, 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 they're going to be in Brooklyn. This, they're in uh, Brooklyn. This, they this have Sabrina they got, Inescu. They, they, pick in the, in the they, draft. Right? Yeah, they have Sabrina it. Inescu. They have Kia Nurse. They have, you know, a very strong supporting young cast. Mm -hmm. It's a young cast. But um, just to be at the Barclays, like, I, I'm definitely going to be a season ticket holder. Like, probably right behind the hoop. <laughs> Well, we're gonna, we're gonna have to have to have to plug you in with Joe's, and uh, you know, saying when you when you ready to get your season tickets, yeah, that's that's shout out to Joe's. He's the one that makes it happen every time we go over to the Barclays Center uh, for the charity event. Thank you actually for pulling up and supporting, uh, you know, what we do with the 2K tournament um, every year. Of you, course, you at the last uh, Barclays Center event, um, you know, so we definitely appreciate everybody that that comes out and uh, supports us. Um, I want to I want to get into a little bit of college uh, basketball, and I know you can really uh, speak to this. Being a, a you know former college athlete, um, you know recently they they have started to allow uh, players to get paid from their likenesses. Um, but do you think that there needs to be more in the form of some kind of payment for college athletes? 
Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, the, the biggest thing for me is it, it's a billion dollar industry, right? So when you talk about, you know, money that's being made, I think that, I definitely think that like, you know, the NCA kind of threw them a bone. It's not even nearly close um, of giving them money. It's like, oh, okay, so you can actually market yourself and use your name to make money. Like you can create your brand and make money off your brand. It's like, okay, so you're just basically telling me that I could do something I was already planning on doing, but that's not going to compromise my amateur status, right? Because again, pros, like you get paid for all those, those specific things. You're still not actually paying the kids, right? Yeah. You're still not actually giving them anything, but you're still capitalizing off of their blood, sweat, and tears. And so I think that, you know, it's, it's a fine line. Um, and I also think, again, it's like, you know, you're also getting a $250,000 check in the form of a free college education. So, you know, there's different, there's different arguments for it. I think that if you play, if you're playing for, and it, again, it has to be a sliding scale, right? Um, the amount of money that a football player at USC is going to receive should not be the same amount of money that a player at say Columbia is going to receive, right? Yeah. Two different markets. But I think that again, there has to be some sort of fairness when it comes to making sure that they're taken care of. Um, what I hate to hear is like, stories of kids like just not having access to food, you know what I mean? Or not being able to like get their hair done or their hair cut for girls, especially too, right? Like yes. it's, it's serious when you're up in college and you got to figure out how you're going to get your hair done. Yes. <laughs> so the first person that you end up trying to befriend when you first become a freshman is who could do my hair? Who knows how to do hair? Who knows how to do weaves? Who knows how to do braids? Um, who knows how to do a wash and set? Uh, you those might be from home. Huh? Because you may be far from home, so you're going to have to find those things out. Critical, critical. Who does the good haircuts? Who going to mess up your hairline? Uh, it's like little things like that, right? Um, you know, I, I think that they just got to keep in mind those things because those things actually cost money. Um, and so they should be taken care of with respect to that. But other than that, it's like it's always going to be a, a fight with the NCAA because, you know, the folks that are running these um colleges, right? A lot of times it's, it's not really the president of the, the university um, or college. It's the athletics director, right? Yeah. The athletics director is bringing in big time revenue with big time, with big time money and big time sponsors. So many times the president is actually at the mercy of the athletics director because of the amount of money that they're wheeling into the program. So when you start looking at it through that type of lens, through an administrative lens, it starts to make sense. Um, why some sports teams and sports programs throughout the country have a lot of power um, at their at their college uh, campuses. Yeah, because we we had uh, we had Smush uh, Parker on a couple of weeks ago, and we we got into it. Um, do you do you think that more high school players will skip past the the college? And, and try to either play in the G League or go overseas? Because, you know, well, now they have the, the – the, well, I mean, it's, it's not everyone that can play in the G League. I think it's like the, the top 25 or something like that. Well, the thing is this, right? When you start talking about it, – it's not an option. Like, you don't have the option to play in it, right? These kids are getting an invite. So it's not even about your ranking more so than if you're it being invited. So these kids have been scouted for years. Um, and so when people kind of get up in arms like, oh, what is this? This kid's going to the G League now? No, they've known about this kid for years and actually materialized into the type of player that they think would actually be great for the G League. And I think that that's respectable because the biggest thing you don't want to have happen is that you don't want to have colleges, which again, we've seen, start to compromise their integrity for the sake of getting a player, right? I, you know, my biggest thing, like sometimes I heard this saying, if you ain't cheating, you ain't winning, right? There's some people that do it the right way. <laughs> and there's some people that do it the wrong way. And so again, if you ain't, you ain't cheating, you ain't winning. It's like, so at what sacrifice are you going to do this for? right? You're hurting the, not only your yourself, but you're also hurting these kids and their families. So I think that the bigger thing is 
by those kids getting invited to the G League, it's actually preventing a can of worms from being opened if they were going to be considering colleges. Because that means that those colleges were going to have to put on a dog and pony show or a horse and pony show, whatever you want to call it, um, <laughs> for those kids, which meant, again, like, if you ain't cheating, you ain't winning. And, and I hate to say that, right? But that also is a very, like, sneaky, dark underworld of college sports. Yeah. Well, now now I want to jump into the sneaky, dark world of AAU basketball. Okay. Because so now we're going to be going down to the, to, to, to the, the girls around your – you know, your age group that you're coaching right now. Um, sure. So well, first of all, you know, cause there's, there's good and bad with everything. So just talk to me a little bit about it. And I guess where can it be improved upon? Sure. So, I mean, I think that the biggest thing right now is that there is an influx of teams. Um, youth sports is now a $14 billion industry oh, wow. and the number of scholarships don't change right? That's the big problem. The number of scholarships are not going to change. So the fact that teams continue to get created um, and you're, you're now plugging in kids who would never actually ever make a travel team, yeah. they can travel. Oh no, you can travel because it's, it's pay to play, right? I think that's the bigger problem right now that we have um, with just AU sports in general. It's all been monetized. And now it's like, if you have the money, you can go and travel. If you have the money, you can name yourself an elite team. My thing is, at the end of the day, like, I'm always going to service the kids that I chose to service because I do this for free, right? If I wanted to get paid, I damn sure wouldn't be servicing kids from Harlem and the South Bronx. I'd be in Manhasset. I'd be in, like, Scarsdale. I I I'd be in Saddle is it Saddle Hill, Saddle Lakes? I think it's Saddle Hill out in Jersey. It's like, I would, I would just be in those wealthy areas, right? Yeah. And I would use my skill set and, and they would love it, right? Those wealthy parents would love it, but that's not the type of kid that I'm trying to coach, right? That's not the type of kid that I'm trying to empower to actually help to end generational poverty in their household. Yeah. The type of kid I'm working with is a kid from public housing, is a kid who's parents are part of the working poor class, right? Both parents work still living check, paycheck to paycheck because they're actually working 80 hours a paycheck, but they're getting paid minimum wage, right? Like, or getting paid under minimum wage. Some of them might even be service, you know, staff at like restaurants or, you know, di different places like that. So I think, you know, yeah. I'm clear on, I'm clear on what I choose to do. And I'm also clear on what I choose to not do because I don't want to actually be part of the problem. I want to be part of the solution. Um, and that's always been my stance from when I first started coaching. Okay. So, all right. Now, and I know you, you love the kids and you, you're going to want to always work with the kids, but um, at any point, do you see yourself moving up and maybe, you know, ultimately, coaching at the, you know, in the WNBA or, I mean, even the NBA, so all that matters because, you know, women coaches up, you know, in the NBA now as well. Yeah, no, it doesn't work like that. And again, there's not enough teams, man. There, there's just not enough teams. So it, it's really a numbers game. And, and when we talk about moving up, I started up, right? I started coaching college basketball before I even started coaching AU basketball. A lot of people don't know that um, because a lot of people just don't do their research. But, you know, again, it's like it, it was a great experience. And in my my experience actually was cut short um, because my head coach at the time actually opted to leave and, and go back down to Florida. And this was already well after the WBCA convention when that's basically where you, you know, do your interviews. And, and I opted out of a couple of interviews that year um, only to find out literally two weeks later that he actually was choosing to, to leave and um, go down to Florida. So mm -hmm. that, that, put, that put me in a tricky position and I was able to um, leverage a, a position with the vice president at NYU at the time, um, who's still the vice president, but he's like gone through a couple of promotions. But um, I worked with him for two years and then took a leap of faith to work at the Harlem Children's Zone. And so I'm their athletics director and it's incredible work. And again, I think that my path and my journey is very different um, than many others. I've been in a really strong space of privilege over my career to kind of navigate, right? And not really work out of desperation. And so 
by having that option of navigating, I've really made intentional decisions on how I wanted my career to look, even having um, faced some pitfalls um, during that. And yeah. so, yeah, I don't really have any desire to, to coach college basketball. I don't have any desire um, of even like entertaining pro, but I can tell you this, I learn a lot. I learn a lot from pro coaches. I learn a lot from college coaches. I, I probably do a seminar just about every single day I go online and I take notes, right? Like I, I, I think <laughs> I have like three of these already built up mm. with notes. And so I'm trying to become a better coach, even though I'm coaching young girls, right? I think that that's the other piece too, is that we, we should never want to stop learning no matter what level we coach, right? Um, so, you know, that, that's just kind of where I am with it. Yeah, no, no, definitely agree. Do you think that um, you make more of an impact on if you were coaching at a collegiate level or with the younger girls? So again, this is this is a little bit of my ego um, coming into place, but I think I'd actually give a, a tremendous impact either way. I've given a tremendous impact either way. On the college level, I made sure that we had internships lined up for our girls, right? Starting in their freshman year, making sure that they had job opportunities available, mm. making sure that I was networking to give those girls that opportunity each and every single year. So that by the end of that time, they've already had a full-time job secured. That was my job and my role at NYU. Um, in addition to obviously doing scouting reports and watching game tape and going out recruiting, which I loved. I loved mm -hmm. it. Um, so, so that was one piece. And so again, um, now coaching AU basketball for so for, for, for quite some time now, and again, I'm still pretty young, but I'm not a new kid on the block. Um, yeah. My girls going off to college, going off to division one programs is absolutely incredible. When you talk about the millions of dollars that's been produced in the form of scholarships for my girls, that's pretty powerful stuff. And so now again, diving even deeper down into the pipeline at the very beginning, like where it really all starts, um, where the girls could barely touch the rim <laughs> and reach the rim. So we have to lower the, 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 the hoops. Um, I, I know for a fact I'm making an impact and I'm making it through role modeling, right? For those girls to see me and my energy and my enthusiasm and my passion for teaching the game and for being so supportive um, I think that, you know, in all three of those arenas, whether it's youth grassroots, AU basketball, college level basketball, um, I know in all three of those positions, I've made a pretty tremendous impact. Yeah, no, you uh, definitely have. Um, you know, so, all right, I would be, I'll be remiss if I didn't, you know, get a chance to talk to you about the, uh, the climate, the temperature of everything that's going on right now. You, uh, you being a minority coach, coaching uh, minority children, um, what kind of conversations do you have with your girls uh, during, you know, times like this? Sure. So, so that, that's funny that you brought that up because uh, last Tuesday, um, we were supposed to have a Zoom basketball workout and I actually canceled the workout to actually have and use that space to have a conversation about equality. Mm. And last week was really heavy. Last week was a really heavy week. And I think that um, I felt in my spirit that I had to do something to, to begin the conversation because our kids are smarter than what we know them to be. They, yes. they know when things are right. They know when things are wrong. And so if we're not actually talking to them about it, we're really doing them a disservice as, as human beings, right? In this crazy world that we live in. Absolutely. So yeah, it was incredible. We were able to unpack again, just what this idea of equality is and how we can march and be advocates of equality, but also recognize that systemic racism is also real right? Inequalities are also real. And how can we actually be champions to our black and brown counterparts on how to create spaces of not just even inclusion, right? But actually just to point out first that there's a problem, right? That's the bigger piece is to point out that there's a problem. And so as a result, you end up seeing these type of inequalities in education and in housing and in healthcare. And again, police enforcement, right? There's a lot of different ways that um, racism 
finds its evil head. And so uh, talking about that piece was also mm -hmm. really important and critical. And again, for the girls to even think about the concept of like not being treated fairly or equally because of the color of their skin, for some of them, it was, it was heavy. For some of them, it was heavy, but it was a necessary conversation. So um, that was a big piece. And even this week, we actually had the honor of having Brianna Stewart talk to our girls on Tuesday. And she actually mentioned what equality meant to her and why she's actually a champion and an advocate for Black Lives Matter. And I thought that that was dope because most folks, a lot of folks are, are trying to take the careful, easy way uh, an, an easy approach. And so again, kudos to her for being brave enough to talk about it, to really um, walk it like how she talks it. Yeah, definitely. I think it's amazing, um, you know, because it, at this point, it can't just be as far as, you know, in, in the athletic community, it can't just be the black athletes that, you know, that speak up, you know, you guys go to war every night, whether it be on the baseball diamond, whether it be on the football field, on the basketball court, you know, tennis, whatever the sport is, you know, everyone is together. Sports is, is, is kind of one of those areas that brings everyone together from every race, every creed, every religion. If you're good at sports, you play sports and you come in contact with all these different people. And it's important for our white counterparts in the sports world to speak up. So, you know, I, I'm glad for her. I'm glad for the, the Megan Rapinoe's. You know, the, yeah. uh, the the Aaron Rodgers and those people that, that speak up. Yeah, but you know what's so crazy, though? And some of them still don't get it, right? Like Drew Brees, like so, some of them still don't get it. And, and, sh and shame on them for not doing their research to try to want to understand, for them to not want to, you know, kind of turn their turn their eye from it, right? I think you know, this is an opportunity to educate each other, but to also educate ourselves. There's so much information now. It's almost information overload. There is no excuse to not be educated in yeah. what's going on, even if you're not a good speaker, even if you can't necessarily articulate it, right? Even if you can't articulate it, at least do the research and acknowledge what is going on instead of choosing, right? Because ignorance is, is a choice. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's, that's my biggest piece is just trying to find a way to learn. Um, and the more that you can learn, the more you can actually enlighten yourself and even others on the situation. No, yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, it's, it's about having a conversation. I, have, I posted uh, on my Facebook page, you know, uh, you know, I was just saying like, for, you know, cause I, you know, I hate when, when, when people, white people will say, oh, you know, well, I got a lot of black friends. I'm always doing this and always doing that with, with yeah. black people. And it's like, okay, that's great. But have you actually had a conversation with your black friends about their experiences yeah. and things that they, that they go to it, you know? Yeah. When we out here, we partying together. That's all good. We might be at a baseball game together, whatever. But have you actually had a conversation to understand what they're going to, and for Drew Brees to, you know, I, I believe the NFL is uh, seventy-three percent black. You know, what your, your go-to receiver, Michael Thomas, is a black man. And in the four years since Kaepernick started kneeling, have you reached out to any of your African American teammates and just kind of, you know, spoken to them to see, you know, what I'm saying, why y'all kneeling? Why y'all? What's what's going on? You know, and um, and I, and I think about you know his his reasoning. Oh, you know, I don't like the flag; it's disrespectful to the flag. My grandfather fought in World War II. And I'm like, well, well, bro, you're not the only person who had a grandfather to, to fight or to be, you know, to be in World War II. Yeah, you're was, missing. He he's just completely missing the point because it's still about you know when he come when he came back, his experience was still completely different. Right. Yeah. And I think uh, Whoopi Goldberg actually shared that, which was incredible. She was like, you know, and, and her grandfather actually served also, but he came back and wasn't even able to vote. Right. Yeah. That's powerful. You represent your country, you fight for your country and come back and can't even have the 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 fundamental right to vote. Um, mm -hmm. So again, it's, it's really just about history. The more we can inform ourselves um, and really get more historical points on on what and how we got to this point today, I think is, is really the key. Yeah, no, absolutely right. And again, um, definitely rest in peace to uh, George Floyd. 
the uh, the funeral was earlier this week. Uh, you know, I, I really, I hope and I pray that, that he gets justice. Rest in peace to Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Aubrey as well. I hope they all get, get justice. I mean, listen, um, there, there's so many names, Anthony, though, right? Like, these are yeah, just we, the names that come to light. There are so many yeah. cases that were just closed. Closed cases, cold mm-hmm. cases even. Um, th- there's a lot. There, there's a yeah. lot. And I think that, again, um, part of part of what is so critical for us right now, again, even amidst the pandemic, right, of like COVID-19 coronavirus, um, is that there's always been issues with authority. There's always been issues with law enforcement. Um, And it's finally starting to come to light. And it's like, no, this isn't just kind of a once one-time situation like yeah. this is real stuff no definitely and, and it's been going on for far too long i mean I, I really hope that with everything that's been going on this past week um you know some real legitimate change come comes from this um you know i know uh cuomo has been talking about um making the, uh, the eric garner uh law um with the chokeholds and police making that illegal as well as making um, anyone making false arrest uh, constitute as a hate crime as well. Absolutely. Um, if you guys at home know the uh, the situation in Central Park, right in our right in our backyard, with the uh, with the white woman who was you know making a false uh, police report, calling the cops on the on the man when she's actually in the wrong, and and, she, and what what happens in that situation is you could have potentially caused this man to lose his life. Because you call the police saying that this black man is, 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 is trying to attack you and coming at you. And when they get there, they're not going to look at, well, your dog was off the leash and it's supposed to be on the leash in this area in the park. Or that he was not attacking at all. All they know is you called them to the park. Thankfully, uh, neither one of them was there uh, once the police arrived. But I'm, you know, I'm definitely glad that uh, Como actually is putting that in motion because that's something that needs to be um addressed as well because that happens a lot we see those videos you know all the time um all right so you know we we, we were talking about the protests did you did you see um roger goodell's uh response in regards to everything that's been going on yeah what about apologizing um (laughs) yeah i know i mean you you weren't you're the only one that kind of had those feelings you know because you have to actually show and prove because I don't want to you know I don't want to say that people you know can't change because I, I feel like people can definitely change it's like you said it's a choice you choose to to you know be a certain way but in in regards to the NFL like I just have to I have to see them you know actually show and prove just because you know they were they were so headstrong going at Kaepernick and the protest and not really trying to even understand why this man is protesting, why he, he's doing this, you know, the same thing with the owners, um, you know, and I want, I want to see the owners actually, you know, speak. I want to see what they have to say. Um, but even more so with that, I, I want to see them act. And I want to see Jerry Jones, you know, and, and, and a lot of these other owners that were really getting that cap that really, you know, the, the guys that, you know, I've kept him out of the league. I want, I want to see those guys show and prove. Yeah, I don't think um, it's going to happen, Anthony. I think that Goodell spoke for the for the entire organization. Um, I think that he needed to do such because he didn't want it to be a race war, right, yeah. with the NFL, knowing that they're going to be um, probably starting their training camps pretty soon. Um, I, I think that they're doing he, – he's doing what he needs to do for his organization. We know – it's deeper rooted than that, right? It's, it's, it's systemically wrong um, on very many different levels. And so, again, we know that an apology is not going to help um, end the corruption of systemic racism in an organization, right? Yeah. You need to actually have very specific policies, procedures, um, ways in which you're actually giving back uh, to show and prove, right? Yeah. So we, we got to wait. We got to wait and see. Yeah, right. Right before you know everything happened with George Floyd, they had actually postponed uh, what they were doing in regards to trying to improve the Rooney Rule. 
So we know that the NFL has a has a long uh, way to go. Uh, but again, I, you know, I I want to see that change. So I'm I'm go- I'm really gonna hope that they actually stick with it and we do see some improvement because there is a huge imbalance when you're talking about coaches and, and, and GMs and presidents in the NFL. So I really do hope that 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 um that takes place. But you know what? What I can really say about all of this, though, Anthony, and I I really mean that is it's been a great opportunity for us to kind of slow down. I'm guilty for it, right? Like I'm always on the run, always on the run, always, you know, trying to go to one of my family members house to take a quick shower to take, you know, stop in and say hi, and then, you know, keep on moving. It was, it was actually helpful. It was actually um, helpful for me um, to actually take it slow. Yeah. And it's been three months. I've never had this. None of us. <laughs> I, I don't even remember. Yes. I honestly don't even remember. Um, I used to make up, I used to tell uh, Auntie Marilyn and, um, you know, my mom and uh, Uncle C, I used to always tell them whenever I got sick, it's like, nope, I can't stay in this house. Uh, I can't, I can't stay in. I have to go outside. I don't care if I'm sick. I have to go outside because yeah. I just couldn't stay in my household. But then I realized it wasn't it wasn't me. It was actually the household itself, right? Like that's why I always have to feel the urge of leaving and not being there. Yeah. Now, you know, again, I'm I'm in Parkchester, but I love my apartment. I love my space. Like I love Yeah. I, I can actually deal with the quarantine in this space. Yeah. No, which again I, I, is a space of privilege. So I'm I'm just really lucky. Yeah, definitely, because this is, you know, this is truly the city that never sleeps. So we've been, uh, yeah, put we've on, been amazing. Rest, so. We've been amazing. We've been amazing. You know, shout yeah. out to New York. Shout out to New York City. Um, I'm not surprised that we figured it out. I'm not surprised that you know crime has been down. I'm not surprised. Um, yeah, we used to ahead of the game anyway. You know what I'm saying? New York always kind of gets it first, and everybody kind of follows that's a fact. Suit. And we're a very strong city to be, you know, one of the ground zero, so to speak, of the coronavirus and to be able to do what we've done, you know, again, you know, rest in peace to everyone that we've lost due to the coronavirus. Yeah. But we're still a very, very strong uh, city. And, um, you know, I, I've been saying this pretty much every week, but I want to thank again all of uh, the essential workers oh, yes. who are out there and they are, you know, doing, doing their thing right now, um, you know, because again, we need y'all, you know, so thank y'all, everybody at the hospitals, you know, people working at the grocery stores, the pharmacies, the fire departments, you know what I'm saying? It's, and even, even the NYPD, we, yeah. need, we need y'all yeah. as well, you know, yeah. every, every, everybody, everybody ain't good, but there's a lot of good ones within the NYPD, and we definitely need our police officers as, as well, you that's know, a fact. so that's thank a fact. you to, to everyone that's out, that, that's out there working. Uh, we got we got a couple of minutes left, so we actually we're gonna start getting ready to shut it down. But uh, Shanae, really quick, just tell everyone at home where uh, they can find you at. Um, give them the website and let them know if they do have a girl that they're trying to get nice at basketball. They want them to get to the WMA. They gotta go through Coach Coach Jones first. Let them know how to get you. Listen to all my brave brothers out there with daughters, to all of my incredible parents with daughters, to all my grandparents that have young girls that are just active and jumping around in the house. Definitely um, send them my way. Basketball is an incredible outlet and you'd be surprised of um, the the amazing things that they can do with respect to the sport. So again, my name's Shanae Joy Jones. You can find me on Instagram. Um, C-H-I-E-N-E-J-O-Y. So that's at Shanae Joy. You can also find me on Instagram with Grow Our Game, which is my nonprofit. Um, and that's at Grow Our Game. Also, you can find me on Twitter at Grow Our Game NY. Um, and again, big shout out, Anthony, to all that you're doing. Um, and I've, I'm just honored to be able to finally be on your show because I've seen you doing your thing. And well, we're going to get you in the that- studio, though, too. Oh, okay. Yeah, we got social distance. We got social distance. We got to wear a mask. But we not the studio ain't open the back up yet anyway, so we got some time. But we, I definitely want you to come down to the station. You gotta, you can't, you can't just do a Zoom interview. You gotta be at the station and rock out with us. 
Got you. It's all good. But but shout out to you. Shout out to your team. Um, and again, all the things that you're doing, Anthony, I think you are making the Jones family and name a, a really, really dope one. I feel like I was the originator. I think we're, we're but, doing that. We're, <laughs> we're, both, we're both doing that. You know? But so. you know what I mean? I think that we definitely, we, we set the bar pretty high for our family. And I think that uh, many many of them actually look up to us um, in interesting ways. And so um, really, really kudos to you, Anthony, for all that you're doing uh, for the sports world and, and definitely for our family and keeping that legacy alive. No, that's a, that's a fact. Thank you again uh, for pulling up. As soon as things actually open back up, uh, we're going to try to actually start coming um, out, you know, to, to, to watch the girls and support um, what you're doing. So we all, we all close by each other anyway, um, really quick. Make sure you guys are following us at home, uh, Twitter, Instagram, at Real Fan Talk. Hit up the website, www.realfansrealtalk.com. Uh, subscribe to that YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash For The Fans Productions. And uh, once again, um, big shout out to all of the sponsors. Shout out to Petro Home Services, uh, Kmart, The Rosado Firm, Soundview Liquors, um sophisticated minds we're a beauty code thank all of you guys and as soon as things open back up do not worry we will be putting the finals back on we're going to figure out how we're going to do it but we will be back at the barclays center guys um so again with that being said shanae thank you so much for joining me tonight um and we'll see you guys next week man i'm trip young we up out of here peace